Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. Hope everyone's had a good, refreshing spring break for those who actually still get one of those. Uh, Beginning of the week, we felt like spring was here and then quickly we discovered winter hasn't completely left us. Uh, uh, But we're we're excited that you've uh, come up here on a cold morning to join us for worship. We're so excited to see each and every one of you here. We love joining with our church family each and every Sunday morning. And if you're new here, we're glad you came to check out First Baptist and see what this thing's about up here. We, we do see church as family and family as church, and we are so glad that you've blessed us with your presence today. It's your very first time. Make sure you pick up a welcome bag there in the lobby before you leave today at the welcome desk. Also, you can text welcome to the number you see up there on the screen, and we'll get some more information to you about First Baptist Church and maybe be able to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, also coming up this afternoon, uh, deacons, remember you have a meeting this afternoon at, at 2 o'clock. A few things coming up. Easter, if you look at the calendar, is not very far off. And we get really excited about Easter at First Baptist Church that we believe it is a time of celebration. And we all love to celebrate and we'll have a, a great weekend of celebration. Yeah, weekend, not just Easter Sunday. We're going to have three services. We'll have one on Saturday at 5 o'clock, and then we'll have our Sunday morning services at regular time. We're really praying that everyone, all of our church family is able to come to one of those and also bring people with you. But as you think about coming to one of those three services, we we offer those three services for several reasons. There'll be no connection groups that morning because we just want to be able to focus on the Easter Sunday morning. We also want to ask people to be able to serve because it takes a lot to pull off Easter and all the different services that we have. So we ask, hey, you and your family, we want you to be in one service. We also say, hey, where's there a service I can help with? Maybe it's the parking lot ministry. Maybe it's being a greeter. Uh, our children and preschool will be going on, going on during that time. So we'll need some help in there as well. And then following each of those services, we'll have an Easter egg hunt. So we'll need help getting eggs out and working with our children during those times as well. So be praying about what service you'll be going to, then also one that you can serve in. Also, we're going to have over 12,000 eggs. That's our goal. So we'll need your help with that. There's still some eggs out in the lobby. If you could pick those up, fill those, bring those back to us so we can get those out for that Easter weekend. Also, if you look around you, hopefully you can still find some of these packets here. These are invite cards. Easter Sunday is a great time to invite people to come and hear the gospel message. And we're going to be presenting that on Easter Sunday. You want to have your friends, family, acquaintances here. It's a great time to invite somebody to come. So uh, take these cards. Be praying. Who in the next week or two can you give one of these to to invite to come and join you for Easter Sunday? So uh, please be doing that. And here's a quick video just to show us a little bit of what Easter Sunday is like. We can like it. love to have you here and some friends. Also this morning, we're going to have Brandon Fisher is going to come and make an announcement about this year's budget. At First Baptist Church, our budget um, ends in March. Our new one starts in April. So as a church body, we make decisions on things such as that. So Brandon, you want to fill us in a little bit on what this year's budget is looking like? Sure. Thank you, Jason. Uh, The first thing is we do have a couple more weeks left in this year's budget. Uh, And depending on how electricity falls, we're either about 5,000 to the good or maybe around 10,000 to the bad. We've got a couple of weeks. So I would encourage you just to pray and see how the Lord, you know, places on your heart to give uh, because we do have a couple more weeks. One of the uh, important things, too, is next Sunday at 2.30, we're going to have a business meeting where we're going to go over the budget in detail, and that's where we actually approve it. Uh, Starting tomorrow, we're going to mail out the budget so all of y'all can look at line item by line item where the money that y'all give goes. Uh, there's also going to be online, if you're a member, there's a login that you can look at so you can see. So I would really encourage y'all to, to look at that, see where the money that y'all so generously give goes and how we, we bless the church. Um, if you want to pull it up. Okay, so we can see here 
All in all, we're going to have a 4.32% increase from our budget from this year versus last year. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, right now, inflation is about 7%, so we're actually under that for the church. We've we tried really hard to keep our expenses in line. Um, on support and serve, you can see those are kind of the biggest items where we have the largest increase, and most of those are medical and um, our electric bill and, and things like that, which I'm sure you know y'all see in your your own personal budgets. Um, but you'll get, like I said, you'll get that on Monday, so please come next Sunday at our business meeting and, and vote for it. And if y'all have any questions, we're obviously very transparent, so we encourage y'all to be there. Thank y'all. Well, good morning, church. We're here with our friend Walker Smith and his parents, Jeremy and Holly. And I've talked to Walker. Uh, he made a profession of faith. And so, Walker, have you repented of your sins and accepted Jesus as your Savior? He has. And so, based on that profession of faith, this morning we're going to baptize Walker in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Spirit. Dead to the old life. Oop. And alive in Christ. Amen. Thank you, Walker, for your obedience. And we're thankful that you guys are here as well. Thank you for joining us in worship. Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord together.
may look at you, know that you go to church, and know that uh, you're faithful in where you serve, and may ask, you know, why, why, why do you do that? Why do you get up on a cold March morning, on a day that you could sleep in? Why do you, why do you get up? Why do you get dressed? Why do you go to church? And, 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 and why do you stand, and why do you sing all these songs? My answer would be, because once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I, was, once I was blind, but now I can see. Once I was a pauper, but now I'm a child of the king. And you know, if, you, if, 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 if that's not who you are, then, then maybe, yeah, maybe you don't get it. I don't know. But I could never stop singing, never stop praising, never stop thanking him for the thing that he has done for me because he brought a dead man back to life. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he's done the same for you. For that reason, we sing. For that reason, we celebrate. For that reason, we honor him. God, I thank you for the day. I thank you, for, thank you that you came and you gave you gave sight to the blind, and you gave new life to that which is dead. And God, for that we sing, we celebrate, we honor. God, we give you our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
the grace. God bless. Amen, church. Will you be seated? See you here this morning. Uh, I'll kind of revisit something uh, John said in worship. Why would you get out of bed on a cold morning in March? And uh, I was thinking about that while we were worshiping. And the uh, first reason is God is good. Amen? Uh, even during difficult times, God is good. Second is the fellowship here is just sweet. Uh, I enjoy, I look forward to, you know, it's a great thing when you like getting out of bed and I love it on a Sunday morning getting out of bed and coming to worship because God is good and because the fellowship here is so wonderful and sweet and all throughout the week I see some of you guys as you pop in and I get to to be with our amazing staff who does far more than you'll ever know behind the scenes and they're just a delight and a privilege to be around why else are we here because the mission is urgent that God has called us to do something he tells the church to go and so we're here to be refreshed and to be reminded and encouraged every week that when we walk out these doors we are on a mission field. Now, this morning we are we're closing out uh, about a four-week study on the book of Jonah, and I've titled it, Why You Mad, Bro? And you'll see in a minute exactly why we're asking that question. But to begin, let me tell you this. When our kids were little, they would come up to me and they would say, hey, Dad, you want to hear a joke? And if you've got little kids, you know when they tell you a joke, nine times out of ten, it is not funny at all. And so you have to do that kind dad thing. You kind of just have to, you know, fake a laugh. Uh, Sometimes you have to do that with adults too, do you not? Sometimes people say things and they're intending it to be funny and it's just not funny. And you have to say, oh, that's so funny. And then Morgan Freeman's voice comes on and says, in fact, it was not very funny. So I tell you that to say this. We have been in three chapters of Jonah, and for me, they have been challenging and insightful and thought-provoking, but chapter four is the punchline to the whole thing. This is where everything, to me, come, kind of crescendos and comes to make sense. And it's interesting to me, and it's a little bit unfortunate, that when most people think of Jonah, they think of a guy who ran, and they think of a storm, and they think of a fish, and they think of him going to the city, and the city repents. Maybe they've gotten that far, but everybody knows the fish. But often, chapter 4 is sort of left to fall by the wayside, and really this final chapter is what really ties everything together. So this morning, we're going to dive in one last time, Jonah chapter 4. That's reviewed just a little bit, the sequence of events that have led us up to this moment. Uh, If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open to Jonah. We're going to close out the last chapter of chapter, the last verse of chapter 3. So we're going to start in Jonah 3.10, and then we're going to go into Jonah chapter 4 and finish this book. But let's review the sequence of events that got us here. So first of all, we saw in chapter 1, God says, go. Jonah says, no. He refuses to do what God asked him to do. In fact, he runs the opposite direction, gets as far away from Nineveh as he feasibly can. And so on his way to run, in his disobedience, God sends a storm into Jonah's life. And sometimes God sends those storms as as punishment, or I shouldn't say punishment, as discipline for us. And sometimes in those storms, we bring other people, innocent bystanders, into our storm. And we see that in Jonah, that the sailors around him are also in the midst of his storm. But God uses that in their lives, and they come to know the Lord. And so Jonah's thrown overboard. He sinks. He's going to drown. But in God's harsh mercy, God sends this fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah has time to think, and he prays. It doesn't seem like he gets his heart right. But he prays and he talks to God and God delivers him. Jonah is thrown up on a beach. What a way to wake up one morning. And then chapter 3, we said this last week, that our God is a God of second chances. He tells Jonah once again, Jonah, go to Nineveh. This time Jonah obeys. It doesn't seem that Jonah has a whole lot of options at this point. 
And God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And we see this, that God gives Nineveh incredibly immoral, incredibly evil, violent city that they receive a second chance as well. And so that's where we pick up this morning. If you've got your Bibles, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Here's how our story ended last week. It says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Now, why is that? Because God, the God that I serve, the God that you serve, is long-suffering. He is big in grace and mercy and love. God loves all people, Scripture tells us, Jew and Gentile, church person, person who's never walked into the door of a church. God loves us all. And the Bible says that God desires that all come to the knowledge of repentance. Now here we might think, it says, in the city repented. We would expect here as you turn over into chapter 4, verse 1, For it to say something like, and Jonah went home rejoicing, and they all lived happily ever after. I mean, let me tell you what. If I preached a sermon to 120,000 people, and even half of those people got right with God, I would just want to walk off into the sunset with like a theme song playing, like Mandalorian or something, and it just closes out that way. I mean, I get excited when I preach a sermon and one person comes and says, hey, God convicted me. I really want to talk and I really want to share with you what God has done in my heart. And so that's how I fully expected this chapter to just close out. One would think Jonah would be excited, but unfortunately, this is not what happens because Jonah is anything but excited. And the story is arranged that if you read it for the first time, you're you're kind of tracking, okay? God says go, storm and a fish, got it. Second chance, Jonah gets a second chance, then it gets a second chance. Okay, everything's going to be good. And then there was chapter 4. Let's dive in. Jonah 4, 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. What displeased Jonah exceedingly? The fact that Nineveh, a large city, repented wholesale. Now, let's not say every single person repented, but largely the city repented of their wickedness, their evil, and their violence. Now, not long ago in our, in our story, Jonah was swallowed by a fish. But there's something that continues to eat at Jonah. So thought one, if you're taking notes, is what's eating Jonah? What's this guy's problem? Why are you mad? Look at verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord, and he said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it's better for me to die than to live. Teenage girl drama here in Jonah. Now, the truth is out. This is what's been eating at Jonah since God said the first time, go to Nineveh. He knows that God is full of grace, mercy, goodness, love. And he cannot stomach that God would spare the people of Nineveh. Now think about it here. Think of the hypocrisy at work here. Because Jonah is a Jew, and all throughout Jewish history, Jonah has seen both in in verbal, oral form, written form, that time after time Israel turns from God, and God draws them back and judges them and brings them here and gives them a second chance. This happens over and over and over and over. Undoubtedly, Jonah has probably to some degree experienced God in his life showing him grace and mercy because he has this experience to pull from. However, Jonah cannot deal with the fact that God would give Nineveh a second chance he was okay with getting a second chance he's great with Israel getting a second chance but the fact that Nineveh this pagan idolatrous evil violent extremely violent city would get a second chance Jonah says it's just too much for me to bear imagine the level of hate a city of 120,000 people Jonah wants to see them stamped out into the dust now when Super Bowl came on 
I don't know how long ago that's been, a few weeks ago, something like that, time goes by quick. There was an ad that played, and I hardly ever watched the Super Bowl, but I did see this ad. And our first thought is this, role during the Super Bowl, that God loves the people we hate. That God loves the people we hate. Now, that seems like a really harsh statement. And maybe you say, well, you know what, I don't hate anybody. I hope we can all say that. But sometimes, maybe we kind of twist our words. And we wouldn't say that we hate somebody, but maybe there's something there. Because God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Nineveh is Jonah's, so to speak, neighbor. Do we hate people? I had a friend who served in Kuwait. And every time I talked to him, he would make hateful comments about Muslims. And I tried to drill down into that a little more, and he told me, you know, I watched several Muslims kill people that I loved. Let me ask you, church, are Muslims our neighbor? I think they, in fact, are. You know, Jesus sent his son, and what happened when Jesus came and walked among us? We killed him. We murdered him. Yet he sent his son because he was loving I see Christians sometimes spew vitriol toward gay people and transgender people. Are members of the LB, LG, LGBTQ plus community our neighbor? Well, certainly they are. Now, if you know me, I speak out against homosexuality and transgenderism because I believe this, they're contrary to Scripture. But not because I hate somebody, but instead because I, in fact, love them. And I believe they're searching for something outside of the way God designed things and they'll never find what they're looking for. But to be consistent, I would also tell my Christian friends that they have to handle their sexuality in a way that honors God. And Christianity struggles sometimes with sexuality, with pornography being so rampant within the church. Sometimes we're inconsistent there, but everyone is our neighbor. Sometimes I see Christians on both sides of the political aisle screaming and yelling at, at one another. Is this Republican your neighbor? Is this Democrat your neighbor? Everyone is our neighbor. God loves the people that we hate. And Jonah has this serious heart issue. And maybe sometimes we do too when we struggle to forgive or when we struggle to love other people. That is a heart problem. But not only does Jonah have a heart issue, he has a theological problem as well. Take a look at verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord and he said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste and I ran. For I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. I want you to see specifically two theological problems that I think Jonah has. Number one is this. Jonah has what I'm going to call a self-made theology. That is to say, Jonah knows Jonah knows the truth. He knows who God is. He knows what God's about. He knows what God wants, but he will not align himself with what is true. Instead, he aligns himself with what he desires. Let me read Daniel Timmer. He says this about Jonah. He says, Jonah knows God's character to be as described, yet he refuses to adjust his beliefs and attitudes accordingly. So what Jonah wants is a God of his own making. And sometimes, Christians, we are tempted to make our theology not about what's true, but instead about what we want. And let me tell you what, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say if you twist it and corrupt it and read it out of context. And people do that wholesale, unfortunately. And so with that thought in mind, the second theological problem is Jonah does exactly that. He twists some scripture. Because did you know this, Jonah 4.2, he's actually quoting a verse in the Old Testament, which Jonah as a prophet would have been very, very, very familiar with the first five books of the Bible. So if, if you have your Bible, hold your place in Jonah. And I want you to see this. Go to the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, and I want you to go to chapter 34, and I want you to see verse 6. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. Hold your spot in Jonah, flip over to Exodus 34, 6. Here's the prayer that Jonah quotes from. It says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, here's the part I want you to see, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, 
keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Church, what an amazing reminder that God is gracious, that he's slow to anger, that he gives us second chances, that he abounds in love, that he is able to forgive sins and to wash our past away from us, that he forgets it. As far as the east is from the west, God is able to forgive. And so Jonah quotes this verse that Moses wrote, and he's right. God is all of those things for both the Jew and the Gentile. However, Jonah does do this. He leaves a portion of this verse off. He creates a simple picture of God, one who loves everyone and never judges. But I want you to see the remainder of the passage that Jonah is quoting in his prayer. Verse 6 again. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Amen. Verse 7. Keeping steadfast love for thousands. All right. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty? You see, there's this tension there that our God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And so Jonah quotes the love part, making it seem like God is just this super nice guy with no backbone. And sometimes Christians do that too. You can make Scripture say anything you want if you leave part out. But we see this tension that God is infinitely loving and he is infinitely just. And so Jonah has a problem with the evil in Nineveh, but the people repented. And we said that God relented. Now let's talk for a second about the problem of evil. Because sometimes, too, we might find ourselves wondering, God, I just don't get it. Why do you allow all of this stuff to happen? You know, you flip on the news or you open social media, you'll find an article or a news story quick about something horrendous somebody did somewhere. Because all kinds of bizarre, sinful, violent, wicked things happen in our world. And sometimes we sit back and we say, God, why don't you just stop it? Why don't you just intervene and stop the evil? The problem with that question is that I quickly forget that I'm evil. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is wicked above all, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We desire to do evil and unfortunately sometimes we do it and sometimes it shows up in small ways, sometimes it shows up in big ways, sometimes it's a behavior, sometimes it's a thought, but that inc- I am lumped into evil and so if God were to intervene and stop all evil, guess what? There'd be no people to walk the face of this earth. Because we all do things that we shouldn't. But however, God does promise to deal with it. Romans 12, he says this, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So in Jonah's theological problem, we have to remember God is infinitely good. But he's also infinitely just. In fact, God could not be infinitely and perfectly good if he were not infinitely and perfectly just. For him to be good, he has to deal with evil. And sometimes people want to make him one way or the other, that he's good and he's loving, doesn't matter what you do, and he is. However, he also tells us to live a specific way and says that one day, if we don't live the way that we should, that there will be a reckoning, that there will be this penance that has to be paid for our sinful activity. How can God be both infinitely good and infinitely just at the same time, holding people accountable for their sins. There's only one way God can be both of those things. And it funnels down into the person of Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary, which we'll celebrate next month for you and for not. You see, when you think about it, God is infinitely just because he demands that payment be made for all of our sins. And we will pay for those things. However, He's also infinitely good because he sent his one and only son to pay for those. And if we'll accept his grace, repent, and trust in him, that we can have a relationship with him and be forgiven for all of our sins. And so both of those are there. God's goodness and his justice held in tension, fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're taking notes, our second thought is this. I want you to notice the siren's 
song. The other night, me and Devin and the kids, we swung through Starbucks. I was needing a little bit of coffee. You coffee snobs, don't judge me for drinking Starbucks. And uh, they got a little snack. I got a coffee. And Hayden said, hey, you know what the logo is on the cup? And I said, yeah, it's a mermaid. And he said, false. It's a siren. And I said, well, excuse me, Mr. Fancy Pants. You know, I didn't know we were splitting mythological hairs here. And, he, and we were talking about the differences between sirens and mermaids. And if you're up on your mythology, mermaids are nice, benevolent creatures. Sirens sing this beautiful song. And then when you go to investigate, they grab you and drag you to the bottom of the ocean and they drown you. Now, I thought this, what an amazing picture that is of idolatry. That sometimes we follow and we chase things that seem good, or perhaps we take good things and put them above God, or perhaps we seek things sometimes that are simply not of God, and those things will drag us down to the bottom. And we think about that, does it sound familiar? Because a couple of chapters ago, it's exactly what happens to Jonah, that he goes down to the bottom and this fish swallowed him, but he still has not learned his lesson because look at verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. This siren song is still calling. It brings Jonah lower and lower and lower. Now hear me out. Jonah was willing to displace his relationship with God if he did not get the thing that he loved more than God. Well, what did Jonah love more than God? his national heritage, and his hate for anyone that was outside the bounds of Israel. He prioritized those things above God. And so Jonah essentially said, God, I'll serve you if you give me what's most important to me, idolatry. Now, maybe we've said that before, that God, I'll serve you, but you have to give me fill in the blank. God, I will serve you if you take away my singleness and you give me a spouse. God, I will serve you if you allow me to have kids. God, I will serve you if you heal my sick kids. God, I will serve you if you bless me financially or if you take this problem out of my life. How about instead that we say, God, I will serve you, period. Because here's what I've learned, that God knows what's best. And so we just trust and he provides I'll serve you, take my life, and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let's continue our story. I want you to see a simple question. Look at verse 4. And the Lord said, now listen, in Jonah's tantrum, God responds to him so softly. Verse 4, and the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Simple response in the face of rage. As you know, my wife and I are both therapists, and sometimes that comes out at home. And I'll be fired up and aggravated, and she'll say, how do you feel? (laughs) Tell you how I feel. I never say that. This is what God does to Jonah. He sort of slips into therapist mode on him. Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Jonah, are you really mad that I've shown mercy to people? What's good, Jonah? What's better, that I've shown mercy or that you're angry that I've shown mercy? And Jonah just leaves. He just walks away. Let's finish our story. Our last thought here, it's a strange phrase, a plant, a worm, and a wind. A plant, a worm, and a wind. Sounds like a great way to end a story. Look at verse 5. Jonah went out of the city and he set to the east of the city and he made a booth for himself there and he sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. So this is, let me translate this for you. Jonah pops a bag of popcorn. He gets his lawn chair out. He carries it to the edge of the city. He plops down in the shade and he's eating the popcorn. And he's waiting to see what happens. He's hoping that maybe God will change his mind and hell and brimstone will rain down on Nineveh. Or perhaps he's hoping and praying that their repentance wasn't real and that they'll turn back to their old ways of wickedness and violence. And he gets to watch from his perfect vantage point the city be destroyed. Verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and he made it come up over Jonah 
that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. If you remember, God once appointed a fish, now he appoints a plant. You get the picture still that God is a sovereign God. Now, this is the interesting thing here. Jonah has crazy priorities. In the moment, he is concerned about his comfort. That is to say, he hopes to watch Nineveh destroyed in the shade. He wants to make sure he has a good spot. God forbid he get a sunburn. Meanwhile, he's hoping Nineveh gets obliterated. Verse 7. But when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed, here's that word appoint again, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was made faint. And he asked that once again that he might die and said, it is far better for me to die than to live. Jonah has perfected the art of the tantrum. But here comes God back again with this response This calming response, verse 9. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. God is saying to Jonah, Are you really upset over this plant? And clearly Jonah is. And friends, this is, remember I told you, there's always, there's got to be a good punchline to the joke. This is where the whole story, four chapters have been building and building and building and building. Punchline incoming right now, verse 9. God said, do you want to be angry for the plant? Jonah said, yeah, I do, I do well, angry enough to die, verse 10. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and it perished in a night? And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their left hand, and, and God adds, and also much cattle, God cares for Nineveh. And this is so interesting because this is well beyond the bounds of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. God cares for Nineveh. Why? Because God cares for people. Which people? All people, me and you and our neighbors, who are our neighbors. Well, everybody is our neighbor. Jonah, who's your neighbor? Israel, God says, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, Nineveh is your neighbor as well. But Jonah is more concerned over this plant and the shade that he has in the moment. And God is concerned for these 120,000 people. Now, I want to ask you this. What do we care about? I mean, truly, could we take just a second and look inside and ask ourselves, what do we truly, truly care about? Because God cares for the people. Jonah cares for his comfort. Now, again, I'm meddling. As Americans, we love our comfort, do we not? We do. And we've got it pretty out standing now are there problems abundant problems as long as there are people there will be problems but you know what i haven't missed a meal i've got a comfy bed i've got a an air conditioner that blows low humidity inside control the climate there's food in my pantry i'm pretty comfortable but i want to ask you is our comfort more important than people is our comfort more important than people is our comfort more important for us than what god asks of us and desires is our comfort more important than being in church because on a sunday morning when it's cold outside that bed is awfully comfortable amen is our comfort our god maybe it is for many americans god cared for nineveh jonah cared for his comfort One hundred and twenty thousand people in nineveh God would say one person, even one animal is more important than this stupid plant that you're stressing out about, Jonah. Look at verse 10. One more time. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow. It came into being overnight. It perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, 
that great city which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. What does God mean when he says they don't know their right hand from their left? He's speaking of this, spiritual blindness. He's talking about the nation of Nineveh. They were spiritually blind. And so God had to send somebody to work to remove that blindness, to share with them a message. The Bible says this, how can people know or understand the gospel if somebody does not go and tell them the gospel? He who has ears, let him hear that we are called to be on mission. Let's be honest, much of our nation is spiritually blind. And so... When I see people acting a certain way, behaving a certain way, you know what? It makes complete sense to me. Why? Because they are spiritually blind. What's the cure for that? The message of Christ. And God would say for us, like he told Jonah, to go and to share that message. But what's even more challenging, unfortunately, is much of the church in America is spiritually blind. You say, well, how do you know that? Because I look at what they teach. And if what they teach doesn't match up with what God's word says, well, then there's a problem there. And the problem is blindness, sometimes be it willful, we're called to be on mission. Now, the interesting thing is Jonah's sort of mentality here was a large probably representation of how a lot of his countrymen felt. That, yeah, God gives gives Israel second chances, but Nineveh, forget about that. Now, let's land the plane. Let's close out this book. Jonah verses 10 and 11 one more time and the lord said you pity the plant you didn't make it grow came into a night perished in a night should i not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left hand and also much cattle now i want you to see verse 12 y'all ready you have verse 12 no the story just kind of comes to a jerking abrupt halt So you get to the end, you think, oh, where's verse 12? Oh, there must be chapter 5. And then you flip over, and Micah is there waiting on you. The book of Micah. No, Jonah is closed out. So why does it end open-ended? Why does it leave us on this, this cliffhanger? What happens next? Maybe, maybe it ends abruptly because I am Jonah. Now, what do I mean? All through this story, the crosshairs have been on Jonah. He's been in the sights the whole time. God says, go. Jonah says, no. He runs. This happens. This happens. He gets a second chance. He preaches in Nineveh, and then, blam, the story's over. And you think, well, what about chapter 5? Maybe it ends that way because the author takes the crosshairs off of Jonah, and they get put on me and you at the end of the story. Maybe there's this invitation to act on what we've learned by looking at Jonah. And maybe the invitation is to apply this text to us. Number one, will we receive the grace that God offers? Because he's perfectly, infinitely good and merciful and just, but there's this justice on the other hand as well. Will we receive the grace of God? Because just like Jonah Just like Nineveh, we need it. As a matter of fact, we have this sin that has to be dealt with, and we have to bring it to Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can forgive us if we repent and place our trust in him. If you haven't received the grace of God, I would love to talk with you about it. We can meet out here in the bridge, this little room right off of our sanctuary. Maybe the invitation in the text is for us to apply the grace that we've received to other people we said this that God loves the people we hate you know life has a way sometimes when you do life with people and you do life with other members of the church and family that sometimes there's sort of these just little barbs that just kind of get stuck and accumulate in our heart where people have hurt us or wronged us or done something to us and maybe we wouldn't cognitively say I hate that person but everything within us All of our emotions, the way we treat that person, it looks an awful lot like hate. Maybe God's calling us this morning that we apply the story, the fact that we forgive other people. Or maybe he's asking us to apply grace in the fact that we share who Jesus is with other people. We say this all the time, living your Christian life is great, but it's not enough. You have to speak it out. We're on mission. Or maybe this morning we should ask ourselves, Will we serve God on his terms and not our own? You know, Jonah, 
wanted to serve God. He kind of, I'm, I'm speculating, but I think he liked the prestige of being a prophet. But he wanted to serve God on his terms, not on God's terms. It doesn't work that way. Either I serve God on his terms or I serve God not at all. Or maybe we fall prey sometimes to the siren song and we make just this, God, you can have every area of my life except for this one tiny little place. And that tiny little place is exalted into a place of idolatry. And it will drag us to the bottom so, so, so quickly. We have to receive his grace and deal with our sin. And sometimes perhaps it seems like we're a far, long ways away from God. Let me close out just with a reminder about a story. Remember, Jesus tells this parable about the prodigal son. The prodigal son gets far, far away from his dad. He tells his dad, you know what, I wish you were dead to me. And so he goes into the far country and he lives this wicked lifestyle, descends to all the way to the bottom, blows all of his money, and he finds himself one morning, he's eating the slop out of the hog trough. And for a Jewish man, this was the lowest place you could be. And he thinks to himself, you know what, my father's servants have it far better than I have it. Maybe I could just go work for dad. It's better than hog slop. And so he travels back home, But his dad, he's looking on the horizon. He's waiting for the sun to come back. And so the sun doesn't even have to go all the way. The father runs towards him. And the son is about to repent. And his father just says, I forgive you. Places a ring on his finger. Clothes him. Brings him home you know maybe this morning you've been running from God for a long long time just like Jonah perhaps just like the prodigal son can I remind you of something that you can always come back you can always come back because as we said last week our God is a God of second chances and we have to receive that grace but we should also be the most grace-filled loving people on the planet Because God has done so much for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning uh, thankful that we could work through the book of Jonah together. And Lord, so many challenging thoughts. Such a picture of grace. And Lord, also the reminder of justice as well. Lord, might we be the people that you've called us to be. Lord, would you continue to transform our hearts, transform our minds, make us into the people that we should be, Lord. Help us to be loving and forgiving and full of goodness and full of grace as you are loving and forgiving and full of grace. And Lord, when we ask, well, why this and why that, would you help us to remember that you say one day, Lord, you will take care of all that. Lord, if we're here this morning and we've been running, today might it be the day that we stop running and that we run towards you, Lord. Lord, be with us. Lord, we love you. All these things we pray in your name. Amen.
Trevor Coots over here on the guitar. Today's his birthday. 